I've been using this timecode rack on my shows for the last couple of months, and in this video, I'm not going to show you how to build it. Instead, I'm going to show you how to make this one. All right, everybody, welcome to today's video where I am going to be showing you how to build your very own timecode rack. Uh, now, you might be asking, Christian, why do you need two timecode racks? And the reason is simple. Um, right now, I'm working with a couple of different clients who have different show styles, like how they actually play the show, even though they're technically DJs. Um, one of them uses show control and there are multiple streams of time code that I have to deal with at once. And the other is a live show using Ableton. Um, so I decided instead of kind of making a one size fits all to, uh, I decided to make two separate racks. And so in this video, I'm going to show you how to make my rack that is going to be more designed as a uh, show control rack with two streams of time code. Um, so let's just go over the different parts and pieces and the tools that uh, you'll have to use in order to follow along if you want to build one for yourself. Um, first thing, uh, most importantly, the whole point of having a rack to begin with is having a cons it, it makes you have a consolidated place where all of your complex connections of various little uh, doodads um, can all happen in one place. And the thing that really makes that easy is this. This is a this is the actual patch panel, and it is one that I specified and had made by Redco Audio, um, and they built it to my spec. I sent them exactly what I wanted. I sent them the text that I wanted printed on there and um, they, they built it as I wanted it. Um, so we'll just run through this real quick, starting from left to right. If you can see it, uh, we have PowerCon in and through. So way over on the left there, PowerCon in and through, followed up by timecode in. Now, to the uh, immediate next right of that, we have two timecode outs, but I'm actually going to switch one of those around so that we have two separate timecode ins and then a single timecode out. Next to that, here we have our USB 3.0 um, connector, and this is reversible. So on the back, there is the, the B side. Um, which we'll actually have to flip around because our host is on the other side in this case. Then we have our gigabit fiber connection. This is a, a Neutrik um, Opticon connector right here. And uh, it has a little dust cover. If you, I don't know if you can see it in there. But when you click on it, it opens up. Um, and then next to that, we have seven normal RJ45 Ethernet ports. Um, so that's going to be our main uh, main source of connecting everything together. It's just going to be in one nice strip along the back of this rack so you don't have to worry about reaching in and connecting different things. That's the whole point of having the rack in the first place. So um, what is that patch panel going to be connecting? Well, I've got it all laid out here. And we'll start from Let's start from least interesting and then go up to most interesting. Least interesting thing on here is probably the UPS. It's this uh, cyber power battery backup unit. Um, I've been kind of going back and forth on whether or not I actually want to put UPSs in my, um, my time code racks. And I've just finally settled, even though they're super heavy, like it's just a big, a big battery inside of here. And I haven't been able to find a good solution for like either a lithium or small battery bank that has 120 volt output. Um, I haven't been able to find anything like that quite yet. So if you know anything, uh, let me know down in the comments because I'd like to replace this with something lighter, even if it is more expensive. But um, this is just insurance. You know, even though it's super heavy and it's annoying to carry around, it is insurance that um, specifically the network switch will never go down because um, the other stuff I'll talk about in here isn't really super critical for power because it's powered by USB a lot of the time with a couple of these things. Um, but there is no real backup for 
the network switch. And if the network goes down, then that can really mess with a lot of stuff because we've got control signal of different protocols going back and forth. Um, so I just didn't want to take that risk. So it's like 200 bucks cheap insurance and it goes in the bottom because it's the heaviest. Um, next most interesting <laughs> probably be this passive radial uh, mic level splitter. That's just for our second uh, or our first time code input actually. Um, just because I need to have a split to go into both this unit here, which is our audio card, and then hop out to an MA since if we have two time code slots running, um, we can only have one MIDI time code input in the on PC session. I'll explain a little bit more about that in probably a different video. But I need this uh, to split out to another output, which would then go to the MA. Um, next most interesting would be the network switch. This here is a eight port gigabit PoE, not PoE plus, just regular PoE. Um, PoE on eight ports, and then it has those two SFP ports as well. Uh, next most interesting, I think, is probably the audio card. This is uh, iConnectivity uh, Audio 4 or Audio 2 slash 4. This is just a way of us getting um, the timecode input to Resolume. That is this thing's only job. It has two XLR inputs right here, and uh, those guys are going to feed the Resolume composition. Oh, this is a tough one. I think I think the next most interesting thing is going to be the MIF-4. This is a Rosendahl MIF-4. It's like a mini distripalizer. And if you look on the back, that becomes a little more evident. We have a couple of XLR ports on the back here, and those are SMPTE in and out. And then uh, the most important part is this USB port. So this connects to a computer and then translates it to MIDI timecode and then regenerates our output and then spits it back out. So I can use this to not only go into MA, but then spit this out into our audio card, or excuse me, our, yeah, our, um, our audio interface. And then finally, the most interesting thing on this table, some of you are probably wondering why I'm using a piece of MA1 gear. Yeah, that's right, this is an MA1 piece of hardware. This is an NSP, and it does actually have DMX outputs on the back, and it grants 2048 parameters in MA2, which is important, and that's the whole reason we're using this. This is, annoyingly enough, just a big dongle. Um, it's a network dongle. You have to connect it in with the switch, so that's another reason why we need that um, activated. So this is going to go in the rack and allow us to control external software from on PC with the computer that is going to be sitting on top of this rack. So this is literally just to unlock parameters, and I guess if we needed to, although I don't have uh, anything on the patch panel set up to output from it, we could in a pinch use this as DMX outputs. Like I said, this is a very purpose-built rack. It's for a very specific scenario. Um, and that scenario can also include the possibility of having no LD at all. So the fact that I can take two timecode streams from show control, I have parameters, a whole 2048 of them, it means that I can control um, ground packages of static lights, um, we can clone into basic club shows, and the artist can have a timecoded show at any club gig they play. So. That's kind of the goal of this, since we're, we're moving into a whole new world of, um, of this industry. So uh, with that said, oh, oh, forgot. I should have started off with this. Rack shelf is two, or rack shelf two, which is another um, super interesting thing. And then a couple of vented panels. There's a lot of like little tiny things that are also in this stack of stuff over here, including this uh, big box of cables which we'll just use as we go through. I'm not gonna pull them all out and show them to you right now, but if you are interested in seeing a full lineup of all of the equipment that I am using to not only assemble this, but like actually the tools uh, as well. So there'll be 
all the individual items uh, on my website. There will be a link down below of this video's description. So, uh, you know, go check it out. I'll probably have some affiliate links down there too. Um, so with that said, let's go through the tools real quick. You're going to I don't know if you've uh, noticed this here. You're going to have to solder. Um, so all of your typical soldering tools, including the iron itself, um, little helping hands. These guys are super handy for <laughs> super handy for not burning yourself when you're soldering cables together, or soldering wires. Uh, rosin paste flux. This is just uh, whoop, rosin paste flux. And uh, if I need to remove any any solder, I use these little um, these little wicks. I think I got all that stuff from Fry's when Fry's still existed. And then the the solder as well. In addition to that, uh, we've got some double sided tape here. This little 3M industrial double sided tape. This is for mounting things to that rack shelf, um, particularly this guy because I don't have any uh, mounting hardware for him. Um, good old classic six in one Phillips screwdriver, of course. I mean, how can you do a project without having just a, uh, a normal screwdriver? So we've got that as well as a uh, box cutter, wire strippers, and Leatherman Wave Plus. Leatherman Wave Plus, because apparently this is more wavy than, uh, <laughs> the regular wave. I'm not sure why it's a plus, but I really like this tool. Uh, some other little random odds and ends. You will need some uh, wire terminal crimps um, because we're going to be chopping this big old tail off of our UPS. And uh, you'll also need some zip ties and possibly some heat shrink too. So I've got a little heat shrink kit if we need to use it, we have that available as well. So first things first, let's uh, clean up our area here just a little bit. I'm gonna get rid of the things I don't immediately need and we'll kind of go through this step by step. Cause I think that's what you all came here for, <laughs> right? I'm gonna leave the patch panel off for quite a while. Um, that'll be one of the last things that actually gets screwed in because we need to have it loose so that we can maneuver it around while we are installing things. So let's start with putting this UPS in here. Uh, UPS again is just a big heavy battery and the sooner we get it out of the way, the sooner we can get to actually doing fun stuff. So like I said, I'm actually gonna end up chopping off the, uh, oh great, I already scratched my table. <laughs> I have to refinish it. Oh man. And it is uh, generally a good idea to start with the heavier stuff on the bottom and then work your way up just so that you have less strain on the, uh, on the whole kit. And when you're doing these rack screws, um, don't tighten them all down until you have done all, all four of them. And then once I have it kind of roughed in, I will uh, flip it up so that it is not putting any more strain on the screw threads as I screw them in. So there we have our first row done. Congratulations guys, we did it. Um, but I do want to revisit this idea of chopping the tail off of our UPS just because I think it's a little excessive to have this big old thing flopping around in there. <laughs> so if we take a look here, um, I'm going to use my other rack as a model of what I'm going to do on this one. And I want to have my patch panel 
kind of directly in the center. And for that to happen, that means that our power input is going to have to reach here. So if we make sure that we can tuck our power cable underneath, power cable for the UPS, and then we mark off visually where we want to cut our cable. So I'll just go ahead and cut that. This is also a point where you have to decide whether you want your power con through to be linked to an output off of the battery or if you want to have it non-battery backup. Now why would you want to have a non-battery backup? If you were to plug this into say an MA, it's not healthy to plug a UPS into another UPS. So that could cause potential long-term problems, but for the most part, I don't think I'm going to be using this to power an MA as well through the through port. So I'm going to instead take a little bit of our newly cut cable and we'll repurpose this as an output from one of our battery backups. We'll chop the other end of this off and put it onto our power con through, our true one through throughput. So we have our ground, our neutral, and our positive. And uh, all we need to do now is add crimp terminals. So we'll just strip back enough from each lead here. Just a little bit. Make sure to give them a nice, uh, nice firm crimping. And of course, always test, make sure they're not going anywhere. And there we have our three leads for getting power into our UPS from the rack. So, so let's uh, tuck this away for the moment and work on making our through. So again, like I said, this, <laughs> this we are going to cannibalize from the other part of that same cable that was connecting the UPS. So again, I'm just going to make sure that our length from our battery output to where our rack is actually going to be connected in the rear is long enough. Remember, you can always <laughs> you can always cut the cable shorter. The cable stretcher has not been invented yet. And don't throw this part away yet because I'm going to use it to create our actual input cables for the rack and the output. So we'll do the same exact thing with our tail here. More crimp connectors. Got a whole bag of them here. It's funny, I've, I've had these sitting in uh, in my closet for probably two years. This was way back from when I was doing other types of repairs and I haven't used them. And I thought so many times about throwing them away. Look who's laughing now. Didn't have to spend money on a whole bag of crimp terminals just for this project, you know. Since this rack has 
surge, or sorry, since this UPS has surge outputs as well that aren't battery backup, you could just swap this. You could take the back panel off and swap this to a surge or a non-surge connector, and that would change the behavior of your power con through. So there is our input and our output for our power, and we are cruising right along. Doing pretty well, I think. Again, just gonna double check here. Oh yeah, we're golden. Golden goose. So I'm gonna kind of call an audible on this one because I haven't built this specific rack yet. And let's throw the NSP in. Stands for Network Signal Processor. These were like the original NPUs. So this was like an MA1 version of an NPU. Um, but we're not using MA1. We can use it with MA2 just fine. Looks pretty in there. I like it. So we'll uh, throw a couple rack screws in there. Oh, not a whole handful. Just need a few. Grab one, grab two. Let's flip her up. Okay, NSP is mounted, ready to process some network signals. Okay, next up, let's uh, get our little shelf here. See how exactly we're gonna, ooh, move the whole table here. Easy, Christian. Just gonna kind of mock it up and make sure that we have the clearance that I'm expecting and everything looks pretty good. The one kind of wild card um, is going to be this. Um, I'm not exactly sure where we're going to fit it or if I'm going to mount it exactly or if I'm just going to kind of throw it in there and wedge it in between something. We shall see. So I want to kind of get a feel for where I can put this exactly. So I kind of want to put it where my DMX outputs would be, but since I'm not using them, that might be a convenient spot for the DI, or sorry, it's not a DI, it is a uh, splitter, which I didn't even know they made these. I've only used, uh, I've only used their DIs. So we gotta think here for a second. How do we want to arrange everything on this tray? Put our patch panel to the side. Um, in my other timecode rack, uh, it worked pretty well to have the iConnect up against the right hand side and then this time the MIF will have to be in kind of maybe, no, I do want the MIF to be facing forward so I can read everything on it properly. There is a little bit of a concern for me about, I don't know if you can see it, um, I'll show you on this camera. So I am a little concerned about these buttons getting pushed by the ledge push me to the ledge. Um, so I will, I'm sorry, um, I'll probably just double stick this tape to the side so that there's enough of a gap where you can still physically access the buttons. And this is kind of cool because it kind of protects them from being hit accidentally. So I like that positioning. And then we also have to consider our big boy switch. <laughs> Cannot forget the switch. Um, in the other rack that I built, there is actually room above the top, uh, the top unit of space, and I ended up just tossing, 
tossing the switch here, which worked actually really well. I might here, I might do this even. Might even throw it here. But I hate how that connects like that. It just kind of falls down. Might double stick tape it here and then use this little tunnel right here for all of the XLR connections that have to come through the front. Because keep in mind, all of these um, RJ45 ports need to connect to that back patch panel. So I'm gonna toss this in here as it sits. See if I see any immediate clearance issues. Shouldn't be though. The nice thing about the MIF is that it's USB powered, but the bad thing about that is that now we have to put a USB hub inside. I also have to make sure I have enough physical room inside of here, so I might end up... The way I'm using this, I don't actually need to power this. Uh, the bus will provide enough power for the MIF and the audio card. So I don't think I will need this little Amazon Basics hub, but, or sorry, I won't need the power adapter for it. So we'll count on not using this for now, but we still need to get power to our switch, which I think will fit. So I'm gonna take this and go the other way. worked in my last rack, but for some reason, oh, oh, there it is. You just hear that, hear that tiny little pop. <laughs> so the switch is now mounted in here for the most part, actually. So I could really, um, yeah, this will work. And the front lip prevents it from being pushed forward. You can't, I, this is a purely a feel thing. I'm sorry, I can't really show you, but Dang, this thing is heavy. Let me see if I can turn it around here. So the switch is wedged up here above the audio interface. So I think that'll work. So let's yank this out, secure these to the shelf, mount the shelf, and go on with our lives. How about that? Double stick life. This stuff is wickedly strong. I'm just gonna score the back side here so I don't actually cut the metal. And then same on the other strip. Two strips is seriously more than enough. Like, this stuff does not come off. I had to spend probably a whole 15 minutes trying to unmount one of the, or not one of these, but an eye connect from the bottom of my desk. So it was hanging upside down and I had to use all sorts of tricks to get it undone. I got to be careful because I've already used half of that roll on the other rack and I have half left. <laughs> so if I mess up, I've only got about one strip's worth of mess up here that I can afford before I have to be a brave soul and go to Lowe's or Home Depot, or some other hardware store. Take this guy out. Oh, and I kind of need this for reference, I guess. So let's just go ahead and butt him up against the side. Now on the other side, I'm actually going to pry these little feet off so we can have a more level adhesion surface when I do these strips. Because right now these feet, these four little rubber feet are the only things those are the only surface area that's contacting. I don't want that. So we'll toss those and run a strip along the edge here because that's the most raised part, which is kind of annoying. I wish it had a really flat, flat bottom, but it, alas, it does not. And that's just so that the front strain relief doesn't stick out too far. To the beat of staying alive, that's how you do CPR, you know? I want to configure our network switch a little bit. Uh, I mentioned before that it has two 
fiber SFP module ports. So these right here, uh, that's where the fiber transceivers connect. And we're going to hook those up using some fancy blue cables. Now, just like with Cat5 and Cat5e and Cat6, there are different standards for everything. This particular standard that I'm using is OM3, which is indicated by this blue cable. It's a nice little cyan color. Um, and it's just a, it's like a grade of cable. It's, it's how, um, how fast it can transmit and how far it can transmit. So uh, I picked OM3 because I'm typically in like 100 meter scenarios um, and any of the fiber connections that are going to be coming to the rack um, are going to be around that length. And this is uh, multi-mode as well. Um, if you don't know a whole lot about fiber, uh, join the club because I don't really either. I just know enough to get it all configured and set up. It's There's no difference in a protocol. You're still sending the same Ethernet protocols. You're just sending it over a tube of glass or tubes of glass instead of copper. Um, so it just depends on your application. But I do have these... Oops, these little SFP modules. And again, these are the same story, right? You need to have the appropriate one. The reason why these are separate is because there are so many different use cases. It's not like with uh, RJ45, it's just, it works with everything. Um, these are specific to the form factor and um, your needs for transmission. So I've got two of these transceivers. Transceiver because it both receives and transmits. Oh, come on. Be smarter than the sliding box, Christian. So we've got our two transceivers here. And those are going to... Let me see if I can show you here. Those are just going to go into our network switch. I'm not going to put the OM3 fiber optic cable in there yet. I don't even know if it's still technically called a cable. Uh, it's just fiber? Fiber optic? I think it's, people still call it cable though. So I'll remove our little safety covers here, prevent dust from getting in. And we'll go ahead and That's satisfying. Do the same with the other one. Oh yeah. Now we're talking. So we've got our SFP. Oh my gosh. Oh, so we've got uh, so we've got our SFPs connected here. Next up, I want to mount this switch, but I want to again check our clearances on everything, so I don't get too far and then have to undo stuff. So that is not fun. Not fun at all. Ooh, we're getting somewhere. Okay, so if I put that exactly where it was directly in the center I think I'll have enough room. Let me mock it up here. You guys, again, won't be able to see this, so I'm sorry. But maybe at this point, I guess I could... No, nah, I don't want to screw it in just yet. Sorry, I know I keep going back and forth, but building these little compact racks is not a... Uh, not something you can just uh, plan out completely. You have to kind of get in with it and experiment a little bit. Check my clearance on the other side here uh, because there is a, unfortunately on these switches and the most annoying thing about these switches is the power is on the opposite side of the 
of the unit. Grab my other OM3 here. Where are you? There you are. That other one was missing its uh, dust cover. It's kind of concerning. Toss that, toss that. And the one thing I didn't really like about my other rack is it was kind of hard to see the indicator lights on the switch, but I'm just marking out where it should sit. Okay. I'm just kind of feeling it with my fingers where I want it to end up. Take him back out. Oh my goodness, this is like literally the last strip. <laughs> That's literally how close we are to not being able to do this job. <laughs> and I would have had to wait until tomorrow. And I've been promising that I was going to upload this video on Friday after delaying this video for so long. That would have been rough. I hope I don't need that stick tape anymore. Can figure something else out if I need to. So let's take a second to think about our cable routing here. Um, one of these, or maybe I can actually fit this here. Yeah, look at that guys. You can fit the, uh, <laughs> if I had any more double stick tape, uh, I could fit the DI here. And I think that would maybe work. I might have enough clearance to, to work with that. That would be cool. I'm going to aim for that, and then we'll see if we can actually make this work. So our uh, time code A, if I think through this mentally, I want time code A to always be coming out of our Rosendahl myth. So this guy is going to plug in to our LTC out. Oh my gosh, it's just barely not enough. I don't think I can make it work. It's very uh, very tight back here. So we have to have, oh, I wonder if I could just move the MIF over by that much. <laughs> but I already double taped it down. <laughs> oh my gosh, here we go. I wonder if we could do that. I'm not going to worry too much about the DI right now. We'll move on from that. But we for sure need to connect to the output of the MIF. And then this MIF needs an input using another XLR cable. I'll grab another XLR. And the MIF is going to get its input from, that's right, the patch panel. So the patch panel, if I just mock this up here, is going to be sitting somewhere in here. These can stay in this general vicinity. And so this, I'm going to have to snip We'll do a little snip job here and then connect it to our input, our time code input with solder. Solder. So that's one job we need to do. I'm going to go ahead and mock it up and then cut where I need to cut. Let's see, let's do. Uh, Yep, that should be the only one I need to cut right now. I'm going to need to cut right around right around here. And then I'm also going to need leave this in our boneyard pile over here. 
I'm also going to need to swap out <laughs> my second XLR port. I realized after ordering that port that I needed to have a second female connector on the back instead of two males. I just didn't think through it all the way when I built the rack online and I just kind of shipped it. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but I do have some writing on here that indicates that you can only plug this into 120 volt because a lot of people use PowerCon for 208 or 240 volts in other countries. And uh, if this was to get plugged into 208, it would fry the UPS. That would not be good. So I'm gonna keep this little plate just so that I can remember, remember where it is. And we will toss this one on. And screw it back in. And then we'll turn on our soldering station. <laughs> you believe they trust me with the soldering iron? I still don't believe it. Okay, so now technically we have uh, two time code ins and then one time code out. This is supposed to send to another MA station. Another thing I need to do while we are on this panel is switch out this USB 3.0 and swap it around to the other side, which takes really no time at all. But I think I might have to swap over to my uh, micro precision kit. Nope. I can do it right here. <laughs> Again, these are purposefully made so that you can swap them around and I used USB 3.0 just again to future proof it a little bit and if I wanted to put storage inside of it like if I wanted to put uh, an SSD to store content on it then I could do that a little more easily and make it a little more discreet of a package so see it separates like this and then you just flip it around and screw it back in there is one uh, tool or I guess um, material that I'm missing from this build and I spent like 30 minutes trying to find it in my apartment um, it's room temperature vulcanizing silicon silicone silicon <laughs> um, I usually use that on all these type of screw connectors uh, on the back side just so that they don't get vibrated out um, but I couldn't find it so I'm not going to use it this time Usually I do, so I'm sorry, sue me. Unsubscribe. And next up, while I am back here, I might as well tin, tin the cups, as they say. So all these little holes for solder in here, those are the cups, and we will need to fill them up with some solder to promote adhesion. Oh my gosh. Can I please just like find something to set this on that's normal-ish? Yes, no. This is silly. There we go. All right, so we're gonna flip the soldering iron on. Remember, be safe when using soldering irons if you are not, uh, if you're not used to using them. You should find someone who is good at soldering and ask if they will supervise you or show you how to do it. I'm not an expert. I'm again one of those self-taught YouTube guys. So this could be dangerous. Again, you should not be doing this without proper ventilation, which I obviously totally have. This will get you worse than coronavirus, that's for sure. Well, I had to fast forward there a bit because I didn't want this to be a soldering tutorial, but uh, we are all 
soldered up. We've got our, our three tails connected here and heat shrunk. <laughs> I actually had to go to the other room because I'm pretty sure I would have blown the circuit breaker for uh, my little office here if I would have plugged in the 1300 watt dryer with a or, uh, heat gun with all the lights in here. So we've got our XLRs connected. Moving on down the line, uh, we will go ahead and connect our OM3 fiber on one end. Um, the thing about these new trick, oh, wrong way. <laughs> so the thing about these little new trick quad opticon connectors, on the back side they're passed through, but you have to remove you have to remove all of the extra plastic around the connectors for it to work properly. So go ahead and do that. It's a little sketchy at first because you can't quite tell where they pop out of, but they do pop out of these little clips. And you just have to be careful to not manhandle the fiber too hard. So there, that's one end off. And I'll go ahead and prepare our other side in the same way. We don't have we only have to do this on the uh side with the oh, this is where you have to really be careful. Because the protective cover on this one got taken off. Not sure how that happened. That's the thing is uh you have to be very careful with allowing dust into your optical system because uh, it's a lot harder to troubleshoot a bad optical cable because it can be very intermittent and uh, cause all sorts of weird problems so you need to just make sure that you don't ever have them to begin with so I'll remove our little plastic dust covers. Make sure we've got the right sides. So they do have to be paired correctly. And then these guys, just like everything else, kind of click in. Click. Click. And you should see you should hear that click and you should see that they have a little bit of springiness to them. Then I'll flip this around and we'll do the same thing on the other side. Again, just double checking. We have white on the left this time. Remove our dust covers, protector caps. And there we go. There is our quad multi-mode Opticon connector. And so then that will go to our SFPs. So there we have our three XLR tails and our fiber optic. Now let's go ahead and connect our Cat6 cable. I ended up using the Nutric uh, pass-throughs instead of the punch down connectors. I accidentally ordered the punch down connectors for my last patch panel. <laughs> and that was not very fun to strip back a bunch of these and um, do this manually. I don't think I would uh, ever recommend you not just doing the pass through option. Cause this is just so much easier. And there we have our seven ports. And we can set our soldering stuff aside as well because we are all wrapped up with that, thankfully. We'll use our last little bit of <laughs> double stick tape for this tiny little Amazon Basics um, USB 3.0 port. Or, uh, God, I keep calling it a port. It is not a port. It has ports on it because it is a hub. 
All right, stick our little Amazon Basics hub in here. And we've pretty much got a, a layout going in this shelf. And then I just need to make sure that our tail for our USB is long enough to reach to our patch panel, which it is. It should be just long enough. In fact, like literally just long enough. It looks great. I wish I would have had the uh, foresight to get some shorter USB A to B, also known by boomers across the country as a printer cable. Um, I wish I would have gotten something less than six feet, <laughs> but we're sitting here with it. Um, I don't really want to make my own. So what I'll do is I'll probably just end up zip tying these into a little bundle. And then we've got another one for our audio interface. Get these XLRs out of the way for just a moment, and then we can do some cable management. It would be a lot more convenient if I had those shorter cables now, but uh, we'll zip tie this together. Zap strap it, good old Chauvet DJ style. Fantastic, so we've got our USB hub connecting our USB devices. Now we just need to worry about getting power to our switch, which unfortunately has this big ugly brick and an IEC cable. So like I said before, the uh, power for the Netgear switch <laughs> is on the wrong side, as far as I'm concerned, but that's okay. So we're finally getting to a point where I feel comfortable I feel comfortable placing the, the shelf into the rack. So we'll go ahead and do that. Clean up my work area just a little bit. Just have to be a little bit delicate with how I route this. Because I want to be sure to not put hardly any strain on that uh, Oh goodness, I might have to uh, might have to do the old switcheroo here. I think we have to take out, just because of the way I did this switch, it won't clear the plastic panel front fascia, but it will fit in there. I just have to take out the NSP temporarily. So we'll yank out the NSP. Yank out said NSP, and I'm going to drop this shelf in, in the bottom, and then raise it up. So we'll pretend this is going in this way, route our power brick. Tell him that he's going in the middle slot. It's pretty nice of us, huh? Nice and cozy middle slot. Then, wouldn't you know, pull a fast one. This way I can slide it up. I know you can't see this, but I'll, I'll show you in due time. Just hang out, chill out, relax, geez. Looky there. Okay, we're really getting somewhere now. I'm uh, I'm pretty satisfied with how everything is shaping up so far. Just want to make sure that I have enough room on the top. And it looks like what happened was there was an XLR that snuck up on top of the switch and was kind of giving it some grief. So I think if I just move this out of the way, yes, there we go. So now I have, should have a couple of loose XLRs in here. 
Yep, there's, so there's our uh, timecode A input for Resolume for our uh, iConnectivity interface. And back here I have our USB cable right there and that's gonna land perfectly right where that's gonna land perfectly where the rack IO panel comes in. So that'll land there. This will plug into here. Just like that. This is shaping up to be a pretty cool little kit. The only thing I'm upset about is I kind of visualized this wrong in my head with the uh, patch panel when I was tracing it out in my mind. It'll still be fine. I just forgot that I was thinking about putting the switch on this side because wouldn't you know it, all of my RJ45s are on the right and I just had it flipped in my head. It'll still be fine. It, it's not like a an issue or anything. Um, it just would have looked a little cleaner. Okay. So around the back here, around the outside, we got to do a little bit of work on our power situation. Remember, we still have to power the switch. In fact, let's just uh, lay out everything that we need to power get it plugged into where it needs to be plugged into, AKA our battery backup unit. And it looks like I need an extra IEC because I forgot that my NSP needs one. All right, we are back with a freshly pilfered IEC cable <laughs> that I, I borrowed from another piece of gear. I couldn't find one laying around, but an IEC is an IEC, right? So we'll get power into our NSP from our IEC. You know me. Um, the one thing I will do that I forgot about until I started making this video today is uh, in my other timecode rack, I use locking IEC cables just because it's one less thing to vibrate loose and I forgot to grab some at the shop the last time I was there. I've got like a whole pile of them that I use with the DJ equipment, but um, I just forgot to bring it. So I'm using regular IECs for now, but I am gonna open this back up and you know do the RTV silicone thing and uh, swap out the IECs for locking ones, just in case you were curious. I know you were. So we are sitting pretty. We got a whole extra battery slot available if we need it. I don't think we will though. So here's our in and our out. That'll land pretty perfectly right where I need it to. Now we just need to uh, what do I want to do right now? We could put, oh, you know what I totally forgot? <laughs> the NSP needs its own link into the switch because it's not an external piece of gear. I just totally forgot about it. So I'm going to use up that seventh spot to just do a quick little loop over to the final or the last port of the switch. So that'll be our number seven, or excuse me, number eight. So that's golden. Let's figure out where we can place our little splitter here think with any luck 
we will be able to just set it inside like that. I don't know if you can see in there. I think we'll be able to just set it in between this shelf and then the back panel. Eh, we'll see. Actually, no, that will not fit there. We're going to have to figure out something a little more a little more creative than that. Maybe along the bottom row here. And then it'll be wedged in between. Let's mock up the uh Let's mock up the rear I.O. for a minute here. This is the, the tedious part. could totally switch up this rack. I might end up uh, putting this I.O. on the top, the top slot. The reason it worked in the other one is because the destripalizer was a little longer and I needed to have it in that orientation, but we might be able to, this might be a little bit cleaner to have this time code rack have the IO on the top. I'm, I don't like how it looks exactly, but it, I think it'll buy us some space that we can use for that. Uh, yeah, it'll buy us some space and I think, I think that'll be the winning move in the long run. So I'm going to loosely screw this in and see if we can uh, get it working with that uh, splitter. I'm also going to plug in my uh, fiber at this point, just so that they're not flailing around. Again, those are going into the SFP modules out of the switch. Or get a little click there. Same click as before. Leave our XLRs dangling for a second. And I'm actually just gonna pick you guys up. Show you what we got going on here. Oh, excuse me. So our uh, OM3 fiber is connected into our SFP modules on the switch. Right down yonder. Right, uh, right there. And I'm going to go ahead and route all of these Cat6 cables into the switch. All right, we have made uh, some significant progress here. Still going to take a little finagling, but uh, putting the I.O. on the very top rack space is going to be the move for sure. So I'll... Uh, get a little further with routing all these wires and be back in a sec. I am uh, I'm happy with how everything's going to fit with this in the top rack space. Um, now I'm going to wire up our power and we'll give it a little test and see where it sits. Right, so I'm just uh, wiring up the PowerCon through setup. You know, good old green to ground, white to neutral, black to hot, or uh, North America anyways. And then we'll do the same thing on our power input. Green to ground. 
and we'll do white to neutral and black to our hot leg. Hot, hot, hot leg. Make sure those suckers are on there good. So when we're all done, it'll uh, look something like this. Got everything except for the USB connected. And the power is run to the true cons. So let's, uh, let's box her up here. Look at that, she fits like a treat. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, I seem to be uh, one XLR cable short for making my uh, my jump between the splitter and the front panel for the audio input for timecode slot two. So I gotta figure that out. Shouldn't be too much of a problem. So now I have loosely Okay, we are almost there. I've loosely placed pretty much everything in here. Only two screws are holding this top panel in for the moment because I will need to get back in through the front in a little bit, but not for not for too long. So we should be good for a second here. Shove these cables back in here. I mean, uh, neatly secure them. <laughs> Um, I need to find an XLR real quick. Just a tiny one. Be right back. Well, uh, I made a lot more progress. It took a little bit of time to clean things up before I came back to you to show you everything here. And we're just about ready to power this thing on for the first time. I still haven't powered it on, but everything is wired up and I wanted to walk you through kind of the signal flow of um, how I designed this in my head. I didn't really design it on paper or anything like that. I was just like, okay, I need this, this, this. Um, so let's, let's walk through that real quick. So if I flip this guy around, we can see here that uh, on our left side here, we have our PowerCon True One input. That input is feeding power to our UPS, the uninterruptible power supply, which is then conditioning the power and then giving it a battery backup and then sending power to out of uh, here and here to the network switch that is connected to all of these ports plus the NSP and the UPS is also powering the NSP which is in the middle back there. Um, continuing on to our time code, let's talk about this for a second. We have two time code layers like left and right or one and two whatever you want to call them um, so number one time code number one comes into here it then goes directly to the Rosendahl MIF the MIF 4 over here so the MIF 4 over here has uh, an LTC output as well so it buffers it and then relays it that output then goes over into input one the left input, left channel, whatever you want to say, on the iConnect, and then that goes to Resolume. So the computer will sit on top here and then Resolume. Um, and that's it. So as soon as that gets sent into um, Resolume, the signal ends there. Um, for MA on PC, that MIF is connected via USB through that little hub that we installed in there. And the MIF is also translating that time code slot into MIDI. But we still need one more time code slot for um, MA. So, back around on the back again. Our second XLR time code 
is going into this splitter. Out of this splitter, it's coming back out of this guy here. So it's coming in here into the splitter. One of the splitter outputs is then coming back out here and this will then go into the SMPTE input of an MA or a command wing, anything that has a timecode receptacle. And um, the other side of the splitter, because this has two output, well, the splitter itself has three outputs, but I'm using two of them. The second output that I'm using then goes back over to our good friend, whoop, <laughs> back over to our good friend, the iConnect. And then, then that's where the signal ends and Resolume gets its second layer of time code there. So I think that's about it. I think now we can power it on. So let's try to do that. I'm gonna wait to button this all up. I'm not gonna put the cables in and put the last, uh, put the finishing touches on it until I know for certain that it works. So we've got our PowerCon input. Do you hear that? No, of course you don't. Because we have to turn on our UPS. Are you guys ready? Wait, let's count down together. Three, two. Sounds like it works. Let's uh, flip on the NSP. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's working. So the NSP is booting up. And now, let's get a laptop and test it out. OK, so it sounds like SMPTE is working just fine. I pulled up show control here, and I'm going to use this as our time code source by taking a 3.5 mil out of our trusty headphone jack. <laughs> and now, whoops, I'm going to take our left and right XLRs. So we'll just plug the other end of that 3.5 into A and B, ignore the uh, improper label. <laughs> I'll fix that eventually, I swear. And then we take our handy USB 3.0 A to B. Remember, this is just the regular 3.0 printer cable style. <laughs> and that will plug in directly to our razor blade, which is running Resolume. So let's pop over here and we see that the MIF turned on just fine. Let's pull up Resolume, and I'm going to just play timecode. Look at that. So we got timecode operating. It is sending to the MIF. The MIF is translating it. And let's see if we can grab it in on PC. Ha, look at that. And we have uh, time code in on PC as well on the same slot. So that's good for our left side, right? So let's uh, check in here and we can see that uh, you guys can't see it. Maybe I'll be able to, I can't zoom anymore, I don't think. But it is, it's showing up in Resolume just fine. So A is showing up, now let's check for B. And B is showing up as well. So B is no longer on the MIF. MIF is only going to show A. Time code is running. And you can see if I hit pause. If I hit pause, time code pauses. And if I hit play again, time code plays again. And this is true if I switch over to layer A as well. I can't play them both simultaneously, I don't think. Although maybe I can, I can. So A is coming into here, B is going into B. 
and Resolum is receiving both at the same time. So if I copy this and do the same thing and trigger the clip and bring the opacity up, change our offset to zero, we have both of them. That is so cool. You can see uh, the opacity of the top layer, right? So there's our A, and there's our B, both running at the same time in a 3U rack that you can take to any show. And it has parameters. We didn't even check that part yet. Let's check the parameters. So if I go into MA, let me save our advanced output first. Let's see if we can pull up this uh, node. Shouldn't be under nodes. Add present, maybe. Okay, I, I gotta configure it a little bit. Give me a second, I'll, uh, I'll configure the node and I'll be right back. Oh, you guys are gonna laugh. <laughs> I was so excited about it all working on the first try that I forgot to just plug in an ethernet cable to the computer and the switch in the back. So I connected one to the back. Let's see here, connect our ethernet cable to the razor. And then let's see if our NSP, hey, there it is. So we got a green indicator, meaning that it is in session. We have nothing else connected, right? We just got this laptop. Let's get rid of everything, no consoles. Delete, delete, delete. And if I go to nodes, here, I'll grab, I'll grab the other camera to show you. So here we can see that I only have the laptop, no consoles, no NPU, and get rid of that random 3D. DMX node, Thanos. If I go to patch only, oh, there we go, it's 2048. Yeah, so there's our available 2048 parameters. It's funny, I, I planned this whole rack build out in my head and everything seemed to work logically when I thought about it, but it's cool to see that uh, on the first try, no less, uh, everything is talking and, and working beautifully, it seems. Well, I wish I could say that we are 100% finished, but we still have to add the panels on the back and uh, add some zip ties to organize some cabling, and then we can call it a day. Thank you guys so much for sticking around for my video. I put a lot of work into this one and I truly hope you enjoyed it. These are two completely different systems that are made for their own type of show. The one on the left here is designed more for live shows that have just one stripe of SMPTE that runs for the duration of the show. Whereas this one is kind of more meant to be for DJ sets using show control. And it's, it's meant to be something that I can just send off with an artist and their management and the show just runs. They both have their pluses and their minuses and I learned a whole lot building both of them, but I'm kind of pooped out on this video. Probably gonna make another video talking about all the things I learned about building both of these things and the whole process behind it. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this one in the meantime. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like, favorite, and subscribe to stay tuned for more videos. I have a way more regular schedule now. I don't know if you noticed or not, but uh, you can get my schedule while all this COVID stuff is going down uh, at christian-jackson.com slash live where you can see my live stream schedule and uh, maybe suggest some ideas for future videos like this. Hope you guys are having an awesome day. Stay safe, wash those hands, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks.